Hi, welcome back to Pirate Smugglers in the Making of the Modern World and today is session six. Uh, today we're going to be looking at a different group of pirates in several different ways and that is looking at pirates in China. Uh, and I think to understand some of the differences we're going to encounter it's important to just recap for a moment what we were looking at in the Spanish Main, particularly in session five uh, when we were talking about the freebooters and we examined for example uh, the fact that they formed a fairly sort of anarchistic society uh, they were opposed to all forms of authority whether it were colonial governors from, uh, in colonies from which they originated or enemies uh, of those states they didn't really um, choose to make a difference they would attack anybody that had any money uh, they created a fairly free-floating and open society at the same time we looked at how the levels of support for piracy in the Caribbean began to dissipate as sugar became important on the islands as the war with Spain ended as England got recognition for its colonies in the Caribbean area all of these factors and particularly the attitude of the freebooters that they just as soon attack an English vessel as a Spanish vessel all of these contributed to the eventual war on the pirates in the 1720s that brought their reign to an end one particularly distinctive feature of pirates in the Caribbean uh, was the relatively individualistic nature of their ventures in other words uh, even very successful pirates like Blackbeard perhaps had a dozen, 15 ships at their command, but most successful pirates didn't have more than one or two, and they usually operated largely independently of each other. We have seen occasions when, you know, Drake would ally with French pirates, or we saw the Dutch and French pirates from uh, French Hispaniola forming alliances temporarily, but the idea that they would work in a coherent fashion for any great length of time uh, simply wasn't in the cards we're going to see a very different situation today over time as we see the Chinese pirates emerge into a very large organization and one that is actually fairly well organized uh, even by the standards of the 19th or 20th century this is a pretty coherent criminal enterprise and we'll come to understand why that's the case we're also going to see as I've mentioned in the past that whereas women were an exception in pirate ventures in the Caribbean in China they're far more common they often compose a significant portion of the crews and we will see that the very large pirate alliance which is created in the early 19th century actually is headed by a woman so women play a much larger role in piracy in China than they ever did in uh, the Western Hemisphere now to understand piracy in China we're also going to have to understand a little bit of the history of what was going on in China because another distinctive feature of Chinese piracy at least in the period that we're going to focus on which is mostly the end of the 18th beginning of the 19th centuries a distinctive feature of piracy in China was the fact that China's state system was in severe decline it was having problems managing its own affairs maintaining an effective military these had become very serious problems as we will see unlike the situation for England France when they decided that they wanted to crush piracy they clearly had the means uh, in their grasp to turn their naval forces on the pirates and virtually wipe them out in a span of less than a decade that is not the case with China and we have to see why that was what were some of the problems affecting China now as I say that I also have to point out that in the period that we've started looking at piracy from about 1500 at that time if we looked at the world the most powerful empire without question was China and it had been for centuries if you look across the globe there is China as this heavily populated massive military and economic power uh, dominating Asia at this time and influencing much of the world around it this is a reality and had been a reality for many centuries China had a long history of centralized governance something that uh, had escaped much of the rest of the world if you look at Europe uh, and 1500 after the fall of the Roman Empire in the 700s uh, Europe had fragmented into these various warrior states and only by 1500 are they really organizing themselves into effective states that can have influences elsewhere in the world on the other hand centralized governance in China traces itself back several thousand years prior to the time that we begin to look at it 
just before 1500. So there's this very long history of centralized government. And it's important to note that this system was based largely on tribute payments from peasants working the lands of China. That this had become the principal economic resource for building the state. And that the Chinese state had gone to great lengths to create a fairly effective centralized government. Uh, that included, uh, particularly by the centuries that we're talking about, a centrally trained bureaucracy. This was something that was rare, if not unique, in human history down to the time that we're going to be looking at. And that is the idea that individuals would be given common training uh, in the Confucian classics, sort of classic works of Chinese literature and philosophy, and be given a common set of values. And through that unified training, they would then be sent out as a unified bureaucracy to help govern this vast domain that was China. This kind of accomplishment, again, is virtually unique. It's only now, around 1500, that other societies are starting to create something comparable to this kind of bureaucracy that had existed in China for many centuries. These people that were often known as mandarins, uh, more commonly they were called the scholar gentry. In other words, they were uh, usually the children of fairly well-to-do landowners who had gone through years of training uh, in order to achieve these positions in the administration of China. And in addition to giving China a unified administrative system, it also provided for a certain degree of balance within China between large landowners and peasants because the mandarins or the scholar gentry served as judges and they helped keep a balance between the demands of landowners who wanted more land and more labor from peasants and the desire of peasants to preserve their land and remain relatively free of the control of the landowners. So a certain degree of stability is ensured by the mandarin system in China in the centuries down to the time that we're looking at. But one of the other realities of China is that, well, it had centuries and thousands of years of experience in centralized rule. It had also periodically been subject to invasions from the outside. Uh, nomadic groups from the north had periodically invaded China. And just in the period prior to the time that we're going to begin focusing on, the Mongols, a group of nomads from the north of China had invaded and successfully conquered China. If we look at this uh, map for a moment, which it's a global map, but we'll see basically what was happening here in the, the north, in the uh, plains areas north of what is central China here, uh, the Mongols had come down and defeated what was the Song Dynasty. You don't have to particularly worry about these details, but the Mongols had occupied uh, China at this time. Uh, and established, at least for a century, uh, their own centralized rule over China. Indeed, Kublai Khan, who Marco Polo supposedly encountered on his travels to China, who he recognized as the emperor of China, Kublai Khan was in fact a Mongol. So China is for a time ruled by outsiders, by nomadic forces, very different from the Chinese themselves. However, as almost inevitably happened, the invaders were ultimately overwhelmed in a rebellion and a new Chinese dynasty was installed. And that's where we're going to begin our story of China and pirates of China. That begins the story of the Ming dynasty in 1364. It is the Ming who restore direct Chinese rule in China itself and establish a dynasty that will rule until 1644. Uh, in many ways, the Ming dynasty is often the best known by outsiders who have if only a passing knowledge of China because, of course, you go to a museum, inevitably, if they have a collection of Chinese uh, uh, art, etc., they'll always show Ming vases, etc. Uh, this was a period in which there was a tremendous resurgence of Chinese art, Chinese intellectual activity as a part of the restoration, shall we say, that comes after the Mongol occupation. In part, this restoration also had an external element to it. Most memorably, voyages by a Chinese admiral named Zheng He. Zheng He had a fleet that consisted of hundreds of vessels and thousands of sailors. So if you can imagine, uh, at this time, 
uh, when Europeans are venturing out to begin exploring the west coast of Africa with perhaps two, three, four vessels and maybe a couple of hundred sailors, here Zheng He is going on this voyage with hundreds of ships and thousands upon thousands of sailors. It gives you some idea of the power and might of the Chinese Empire at this time compared to, let us say, Western competitors. And again, if we go back to the map for a second and just get a quick look at what Zheng He did, uh, his travels took him down into Southeast Asia, all the way down here into the Malaccan Straits, uh, up along the coast of India, all the way to the Arab Peninsula, and down parts of the coast of Eastern Africa. So it was an incredible set of voyages that he undertook with this incredible armada that he had been put together, and it demonstrated just how powerful China still was at this time. However, something else that's always noted about uh, Zheng He's expeditions is that they were not meant as expeditions of conquest or even commerce. Yes, he engaged in some commerce. He actually set up a trading outpost at Malacca, if you remember Malacca in Malaysia. And that's where the Portuguese had an outpost eventually. Uh, but that was not his principal purpose. His principal purpose was essentially a show of force uh, on the part of China to demonstrate to these various societies in the region uh, just how powerful China was and how owing uh, of respect these other societies were to China uh, and owing payments of tribute, for example, to recognize the power of the Chinese emperor. So the character of these explorations on the part of Zheng He is very different from that of the Westerners who will come a century later. The Westerners, of course, are very interested in trade, and of course, if they have the opportunity, some type of conquest, occupying areas, or at least trying to establish outposts. Uh, that is not the purpose of Zheng He. This tells us something about what was happening in China at this time, and it's one of these stories that, because of the monumental change, historians have all kinds of interpretations as to why under the Ming Dynasty, particularly after the first couple of emperors, uh, China becomes, uh, if you will, almost trapped in time. China stops moving forward. China seems to focus on preserving what it has in terms of its culture, its technology, uh, its political system. There is little effort or initiative towards innovation. Uh, why this happened exactly, in part, it's argued that it was a reaction against the Mongol occupation, uh, that the Chinese want to simply restore, the Ming want to restore what was China rather than changing it. Uh, there are arguments about the administrative system uh, in China that the emperor uh, has for centuries been surrounded by eunuchs who are his advisors and that they are cutting him off from contact with the local elites, and this is leading uh, to an atrophy of political power, a failure to maintain contact with the larger population and the problems and the need to look for solutions. There are a variety of explanations, but the fact is China certainly seems to lose the dynamism that had marked its political system and its culture for so many centuries, and this process will continue over the next few centuries right into the time that we're going to be talking about, the early 19th century. Now, these problems continue under the successors uh, to the Ming, the Manchus. The Manchus were another occupying force, another invading group from the north. And they established their own dynasty, the Jin Dynasty, which will last from 1644 down to 1911 which is really the end of dynastic rule in China. That's the first modern Chinese revolution, uh, the establishment of the Chinese Republic at that time. But the Qin are the ones from 1644 on who will rule China. And the Qin will face some of the same problems, uh, some of the same sort of atrophying of dynamism uh, in the political and cultural spheres. And they also have more practical problems as well. One of the practical problems they have is a population explosion. Roughly from the time that the Qin take power in 1644 up until the end of the 18th century, the population of China essentially doubles, about 150 years. You go from 175 to 350 million people. This is an enormous increase 
populations just had not been increasing at this rate before. Why exactly? Again, we have a variety of explanations uh, that more agricultural land was opened up producing more food, the possibility to feed more people, therefore more people survived. The introduction of food products from the Western Hemisphere, potatoes, mm -hmm. peanuts mm -hmm. that are high protein or high caloric mm -hmm. products and therefore produce more nutrition per acre than more traditional products, let us say, like rice. Whatever the explanations, Chinese governments, the Chinese dynasty, the Qin dynasty, was going to be faced with a constant problem of an ever-expanding population and how to sustain that population and feed it, particularly since there was little in the way of technological innovation going on. If you're not innovating, if you're not coming up with new ways of improving agricultural productivity, how are you going to keep up with this expanding population? And in fact, China would be hit by a series of famines down through the next several centuries. And this population explosion, as we will see, also has a role to play in producing a population that was ideal for recruitment as pirates. And we will see exactly how that happens in a few minutes. Another characteristic of uh, China's history that goes back long before the Qin, uh, the Ming, uh, the Mongols, uh, was the issue of commerce and mercantile activity. Earlier historians have created sort of a simplistic view that commerce was simply a minor part of China's economic activities. Uh, this was never really true. Commerce was always important. You couldn't possibly have an empire of this size and not have a substantial flow of commercial activity. The society simply couldn't have survived. And the fact is, all the way back at least to the 8th century BC, we know that Chinese goods were being traded all the way across Asia into the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, products from China were flowing into the Roman Empire in ancient times. So we know that trade has been significant. However, it is also true that merchants did not hold the same social status that they did in Western societies. The social ideal in China was the peasant, peasant life. Uh, peasants were seen as the most important group in society. That didn't mean they had any real power, that they weren't dirt poor, but they were seen as the ideal because they were the ones that produced the fundamental food products that made Chinese society possible. And now it's a little bit like, you know, American farmers. We idealize the American farmer and his independence and so forth and the uh, American farm family, etc because they produce food for us and so forth. But of course, at the same time, they get treated in a rather shabby fashion. They're always in debt up to their ears. They're facing foreclosure. The government cuts their subsidy programs. So they're seen as an ideal, but that doesn't mean they're treated well. Well, China is the same way. Peasants are seen as the ideal. The, this is what life should really be about. Merchants, on the other hand, were ranked just below actors. Hmm. Uh, in Chinese society, and actors were ranked just about the same level as prostitutes. And so um, merchants were seen as suspect in their activities. Uh, from a philosophical point of view, the idea was that merchants were essentially middlemen who paid a low price to peasants for their products and then charged a high price to urban dwellers for those same products. So they're seen as being parasitic in many cases uh, in their function, that they are not a pro they are not productive members of society. And Chinese emperors periodically would impose uh, either forced loans on merchants or even simply confiscate their wealth at times uh, because of that situation. So there was always a, let's say, a troubled relationship between the powers that be in China, the imperial bureaucracy and the emperor, and the merchant community. They certainly needed each other to survive. China couldn't survive without commerce, but on the other hand, merchants uh, were looked upon as somewhat suspect characters, and they certainly did not have the political input that large landowners and the scholar gentry or the, the mandarins had. And as a result, they were still seen, despite the wealth that they might generate, as second-class citizens. And this will come to play a role, too, in how China deals 
with questions of international commerce and why smuggling and even piracy become so prevalent in China. We'll see how all of this evolves in a minute. Another reality of China in terms of commercial activity was that there was a level of official commercial activity carried on by the state uh, that was supposedly tribute. In other words, that societies such as Cambodia and uh, Vietnam and Southeast Asia were supposedly paying tribute to the Chinese emperor. In fact, what was really going on is that it was an official form of commerce. It was called tribute, but it's really an official form of trade. So the Chinese government, although it looks down upon commercial activity, etc., uh, needs this activity often to acquire goods and engages in trade, but it's done under the rubric of tribute payments, that these tribute-paying states are paying this tribute in respect to the power of the Chinese emperor. But on another level, uh, there are also commercial activities going on uh, as joint enterprises between the state and private merchants. And even more importantly, there are a large number of private merchants carrying on international trade. So despite the sort of problematic relationship between uh, the imperial system and merchants, the fact is there was a thriving international trade throughout most of China's history. Now, the other reality is that while there was a thriving international trade through most of this history, periodically the imperial state imposed bans on international trade. For example, the Ming, when they come to power, issue a policy that was known by this famous quote, and that is, no inch of board being allowed to enter the sea. In other words, there was to be no international trade. No ships were to leave the Chinese coast to engage in international trade. They could go along and engage in uh, coastal trade among the various towns and cities on China's coast, but they were not to get, engage in international trade. It is believed uh, that the Ming had done this uh, because they felt after the Mongol occupation that the most important things that they needed to focus on was rebuilding agriculture. There had been a series of famines and uh, ca agricultural catastrophes at the end of the Mongol occupation. They needed to rebuild agriculture and they needed to emphasize defense. So international trade that would bring foreigners to China's shores, uh, the expenditure of resources on international trade would be wasteful at this time. China needed to look inward and to focus on its own defense and on its agricultural development. Now at other times, the imperial system engaged in bans on international trade that were political in nature. They weren't getting along with somebody. For example, the Japanese uh, were frowned upon by the Chinese as not a very developed society, as a society that took most of their culture from China, as a society that didn't have much in the way of resources that they wanted, uh, so that they at times would ban trade with Japan that was seen as unimportant to them. Uh, there were hostilities that broke out periodically with Korea, so there would be a ban on trade against Korea. Uh, on another occasion, uh, after the Ming had taken power, uh, there were forces on the island of Taiwan, which you're probably familiar with off the coast of China. Uh, there were forces on the island of Taiwan, sort of reminiscent of you know, today's world, that were still loyal to the old Mongol dynasty, the old Mongol empire. And therefore, there was a trade ban against trade with Taiwan until such time as those forces were eliminated. So these were the kinds of things that we see happening in modern times, where the United States imposes a trade embargo on you know, Cuba or on North Korea or you know, whatever for political reasons. We're not getting along with this country, so we ban trade. But there are also these larger bans, such as the one that the Ming imposed uh, at the outset of their rule. Another ban on trade occurred beginning in 1522 uh, because of the activities of Europeans. Europeans had come to the coast, uh, including the Portuguese, and especially the Portuguese, and their interactions with the Chinese had led to considerable unrest. Uh, much of this had to do with uh, Portuguese behavior. Uh, in part, 
cultural misunderstandings. For example, the Portuguese sailed into Canton, a major port, uh, and while they were there, they raised their flag and then they fired their cannon off as a salute, you know, as ships do in the West, entering a, a friendly harbor and, and recognition of uh, the prestige of the power that you're visiting, you fire off your cannon, it's a salute. Uh, well, in China, that was seen as a, an act of war, <laughs> not as a salute. Uh, and in addition, the uh, Portuguese came with letters addressed to the Chinese emperor that addressed him virtually as an equal. And of course, the Chinese emperor was seen as uh, the supreme ruler of this enormously powerful society, as the most important society on earth from the view of the Chinese. And here were the Portuguese, these dirty little men with beards, trying to address him as if he were just another common citizen of China. Uh, so that didn't sit very well. And in general, uh, the Portuguese uh, did not want to obey Chinese law. Uh, just like their behavior in India, and that is you know, when they got to Canton, uh, the Chinese officials showed up and said, well, we'd like to collect, you know, the duties, the you know, taxes that are due on these goods that you're bringing in, and the Portuguese would say, okay, we're not going to do that. They would beat up the officials, throw them into the ocean, and say, we're not paying the duties. This didn't sit well with the Chinese either. So, given these types of experiences, the Chinese imposed a ban on all Europeans for a while, uh, but in particular on the Portuguese who had really annoyed them. So we do have a series of periods uh, running from really the mid-1300s down through the next several centuries where international trade is either banned for specific areas, is banned in general for a while by the Ming, or banned with Europeans, etc. So it's a very dicey situation for much of the history of the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s and on as the imperial system at one time or another issues specific international trade bans or issues blanket international trade bans. As a result of these conditions where trade was banned almost as often or maybe more often than it was allowed in terms of international trade, uh, smuggling became a common practice in China. In fact, there was a specific term for it. It was called Zhao uh, Zi, which means it's translated as operating for one's private benefit. Chinese are very polite about this kind of thing. You, know, you don't say, oh, well, it's smuggling. You know, we're breaking the law. You say you're operating for your own private benefit. What it meant was you're engaged in smuggling. And in times when international trade was virtually totally banned, smuggling was rampant. I point out this period, 1436 to 1510, uh, during the Ming Dynasty, when smuggling was at one of its all-time highs in terms of the number of people and how much of uh, international trade was moving illegally. And it had to because you had this ban by the Ming who were saying, well, you can't trade at all internationally. The problem with trying to impose these bans, although they sounded good when you know, the Ming dynasty decided, okay, no more trade with foreigners for a while, is that all kinds of powerful families along China's coast uh, are involved in international trade. In China's major cities, places like Canton and Shanghai, etc., are all on the coast, and there many powerful families have major commitments to international trade. So they can't afford to just sit back and let these bans actually function. They have to smuggle in order to survive. Smuggling took on massive proportions such that, for example, when Zheng He's super fleet, this fleet of hundreds of vessels, encountered a fleet of smugglers, they actually beat back Zheng He's attack. So here is the leading admiral of China with this massive fleet, and yet the smuggling fleet that he encounters is so large and well armed that they're actually able to drive him back, and they go on functioning. Now, we've talked about the fact that generally with smugglers and pirates, once you know, the state decides to sit on them, well, that's pretty much it. And yet here you have the most powerful fleet assembled in China down to that time, and it really is unable to crush the smugglers at this point. To understand uh, just how massive smuggling became under these international bans, uh, we have to look at a couple of examples. One of them uh, was that of Liang Daoming, uh, who ran a band of smugglers of about 5,000. Now, much of this smuggling uh, was taking place off the coast of China. 
on islands. Okay? It was not at this time on the mainland itself. Most of the smugglers operated off the coast for the obvious reason that if you operate on the coast, uh, then the imperial government could bring its land army to bear upon you. But if you operate on the islands off the coast, that's a different situation. Again, if we look, yeah, let's see, okay. This map shows us southern China and the South China Sea. Here is Canton or Guangzhou, as it's known now. Up here, uh, there's Macau, which, of course, is the Portuguese outpost later on, but Canton is the one we're going to focus on. And it's this area here that we see a massive amount of uh, smuggling going on at this stage. And in part off a series of islands that are too small to see here, but also on Henan Island, which is this massive island here, this down through the centuries became a major smuggler and pirate outpost, again, because it leaves you free to smuggle and carry out pirate activities along the coast, but it also makes it a bit more difficult for the imperial government to attack you since you're operating off the mainland itself. Now, another example in the 16th century, Zhang Lian's smuggling operation of 200,000. He's got 200,000 people in his smugglers' operation. He actually operated on the mainland, and that, in fact, was building castles uh, to defend his outposts for smuggling. And here we have to say also that when I'm talking about smuggling, the difference between smuggling and piracy here is razor thin, uh, depending on what you're talking about, because most of the smugglers, first of all, are armed. Uh, so they go out assuming that they're going to have to defend themselves against a possible attack uh, by the Chinese Navy. And secondly, uh, if you engage in smuggling, why not engage in a little piracy along the way, right? You know, you're engaged in one illegal activity, why not do the other? So this is, they are largely defined as smugglers, from the major part of their activities, but in fact the Chinese government usually referred to them as pirates, and indeed they were also engaged in piratical activity. Uh, and in this case, again, the Ming Dynasty has to send an army of 200,000 against these smugglers in order to suppress the activity. That's how widespread it had become. However, the ability of the Chinese Navy to defeat these smugglers, those who operated offshore, is still minimal. Uh, the best of the Chinese admirals are defeated by Chinese smugglers. So we have a situation where, where the state is making vigorous attempts, at least, uh, to crush the smugglers. They are so numerous, so well armed, it's virtually impossible for the state to carry out this activity and to fully suppress smuggling. So by the 1500s and by the 1600s, smuggling and with it, various acts of piracy have become widespread, uh, particularly along the South China coast. It becomes a tradition, shall we say, and one engaged in by a very large part of the population. And here, something to keep in mind for the rest of what we're talking about today, it means that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people along the coast, maybe even millions, are directly tied into the smuggling and piracy networks. It's important for them. They sell supplies to the smugglers and pirates. They buy some of the goods. They trade in the goods that are smuggled and pirated. So you have a very large constituency on the mainland of people who are committed to these activities. That's going to make it, of course, all that much more difficult to wipe out these sources of smuggling and piracy because of the number of people that have been integrated economically into these activities. One of the most famed pirates and smugglers of the ta time was Wang Ji, who was called the King of the Clean Sea, uh, supposedly because he had swept the sea clean of the Chinese admirals and the Chinese Navy. Uh, he operated on the south coast of China between 1552 and 1557. And he is fairly typical of what I've been describing here, and that is someone who, yes, is engaged in smuggling activities, but also, as much as anything else, is also engaged as a pirate, uh, and taking on and robbing ships and defending his smuggling activities with armed vessels. Now, smuggling was made all the more successful because of close international connections, particularly with Japan and Vietnam. 
and we'll get into particularly Vietnam in a little bit because Vietnam plays a central role in the rise of the great uh, pirate confederacy later on. But these were two places where Chinese could not legally engage in international trade through much of this period, and therefore they were ideal sources of commerce for the smugglers and the pirates. And indeed, not all of the smugglers and pirates were Chinese. Many of them were Vietnamese or Japanese who also engaged in these activities. So it gives an important international connection for the pirates and the smugglers. As we've seen in the case of Spain, in the case of Portugal, this kind of activity can only go on, particularly at this level, because this makes the Spanish and Portuguese smugglers and pirates look like pikers in terms of the level of activity. It can only be successful with the cooperation of officials within the government. Government officials are involved in this process. In fact, smuggling had become professionalized. Uh, officially, you can't trade internationally during much of this time. But government officials and some of the highest officials in the imperial government, you know, major deputies heading major elements of the government reporting directly to the emperor, are writing documents that allow the trade to go on. Because they say, well, you know, you're not supposed to build any large seagoing vessels. OK, well, you're given authorization to do so because, well, the vessel this size is needed uh, for the salt trade along the south coast of China. Uh, we're authorizing uh, this sailing of 12 merchant vessels this week from Canton because they're going to trade in Macau. That's not true. You already know that. You already know they're going to Japan to carry out trade. So there's an official process now. It isn't just looking the other way. Officials are actually creating the documents. They're setting up schedules for the sailing of these vessels so that you don't have a huge number of them sailing at one time and bringing uh, official notice, you know, if there's this overactivity in a port that's clearly international in form, the government is going to get upset and start looking into it more closely so you try to spread out the sailings of vessels. I mean, the, the bureaucracy is actually facilitating this process by creating the false documents and by helping schedule the actual sailing of these smuggling ventures. Now the government did actually make attempts uh, to stop the smuggling and stop the piracy. Uh, specifically, it appointed a general, Zhu Wan, uh, to take on this job. Uh, Zhu Wan was a very honest Chinese government official, very dedicated uh, to the emperor, uh, to the dynasty, and preserving uh, its policies. And as a result, he took on the campaign against smuggling between 1547 and 1549. He was very successful. There were massive arrests of smugglers, uh, seizure of vessels and goods, even the arrest of many petty officials who were involved in the smuggling trade. And as a result of his success, Zhu Wan was arrested and thrown in jail, where he finally committed suicide because he felt so disgraced by what had happened to him. What had happened is that he had been too successful. He had offended all of the vested interests that were tied up in smuggling and piracy at this time. Leading government officials, leading government ministers were part of this whole process. And here is this general going around arresting all of the smugglers, seizing their vessels and their cargo, causing huge losses uh, of money for wealthy families on the coast and, of course, endangering the reputation of senior officials uh, who would, of course, be caught red-handed if the trail was followed far enough back up the line. These people would be implicated and they could wind up losing their heads. So he is accused of exceeding his authority, etc. Uh, thanks to the influence of some senior officials in the government, he's arrested and unable to accept the disgrace of his own arrest for doing his job. Uh, he commits suicide. Uh, his successor met a similar kind of fate. He, too, was arrested. And in his case, uh, instead of committing suicide, he was executed. <laughs> so his crime was being too successful in suppressing smuggling. The government needs to show that it's trying to prevent smuggling. But when officials are too zealous in pursuing the smugglers, they violate the interests of a wide range of people, not only 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people tied into smuggling on the coast, but also wealthy families and some senior and very powerful officials in the government. As a matter of fact, the person who was the second successor to Zhu Wan also wound up in jail, although they wound up sending him into exile. So in three successive occasions, the occupier of this position, the anti-smuggling position, found themselves arrested for doing their job because the reality is the smugglers were closely tied into, in fact, they were an essential part of the fabric of the central government, and they were not going to let these campaigns go too far. It's a little bit like following drug smugglers. You know, it's one thing to arrest a lot of petty criminals on the streets, but if you start going up high enough and getting into uh, the possibility of threatening government officials, uh, you might find yourself in some trouble even in this country. Um, this is what happened to these people who were set out to suppress the smuggling trade in China in the 1500s. Now, Wang Ji is again one of the most successful smugglers in the history of China. Again, he is the king of the clean sea, the one who had fended off the Chinese Navy successfully. After his successful defense of his smuggling fleet, he begins to build a position on the mainland by 1552, where he has a fairly substantial land-based force to defend his interests and is using the mainland as his main smuggling base. So what is the government to do? I mean, its previous efforts, you know, going after the smugglers and arresting them, that leads officials to get arrested and executed. On the other hand, the outright military attacks, whether they're naval or whatever, have been unsuccessful in suppressing the smuggling and pirate activity. So instead what they do is they grant him an amnesty. They say, okay, as long as you stop smuggling from now on, we'll forget all about this. All right, we'll pretend you weren't a smuggler. Uh, you can keep what you got. You can keep your ships and the money that you made out of all of this, but just stop smuggling. In the case of another smuggler, Zheng Zilong, in 1640, not only was he given an amnesty, he was also made a local governor. <laughs> obviously, he demonstrated a great deal of initiative, ability to command troops, etc. So, obviously, he had the talents to be a governor. Why not make him a governor? So, we have the interesting case of, you know, the government official who tries to suppress piracy, he winds up in jail. Meanwhile, <laughs> the smuggler and pirate, he gets an amnesty and gets appointed as a governor. The government was facing up to the reality that it was unable to suppress these groups. So what's the solution? You grant them an amnesty and hope you know, they commit themselves to not committing any more acts of piracy, etc. However, this came right at the end of the Ming Dynasty. This is 1640. Remember, the Ming Dynasty is going to be over in 1644 and the Qin takeover. Well, as far as Zheng Zilong was concerned, that was an agreement with the Ming. They're gone, right? So he went back to his old ways. Time to start smuggling again. So when the Qin Dynasty came in, they had to make another grant of amnesty to him to get him to stop again. One of the problems with amnesties. Huh? Between 1661 and 1683, the Qin themselves engage in another wholesale ban on international trade. And of course, the result is that this wholesale ban, the same kind of thing that the Ming did, not just the selective bans, but the wholesale ban on international trade, sets off another explosion in smuggling. Each time one of the dynasties decides that they're going to completely ban international trade, they make things worse because now the only way to continue uh, this vital part of the economy of coastal China is to engage in smuggling. By 1717, the Qin had started to ease up, recognizing, as the Ming had done before, that that kind of total ban was simply impossible to enforce. And in fact, restrictions would be eased, the total ban would disappear, there would be selective bans and restrictions, uh, as there almost always were on international trade in this period. Uh, but in the early 18th century, uh, things are easing up and international trade on a legitimate basis is becoming much more viable. Not surprisingly, as a result of that, 
smuggling is going to drop dramatically. In fact, by 1760, the South China Sea, which had been rife with smuggling activities and piratical activities, is described as the Tranquil Sea. Things have calmed down. Everything's okay because the total ban is gone. People can carry out trade once again. You still have some pirates, but it's kind of penny ante stuff. And the whole situation has tr quieted dramatically as compared to what was going on, particularly in the 1500s. However, things turn around once again, beginning in 1795. And this is the period where we're going to start looking closely at what happens. You know, this is the focus on Chinese pirates today. Between 1795 and 1810, there's an explosion in piratical activity. South China will come to be dominated by a community of pirates that numbered at any one time perhaps 50,000. And remember when we were talking about the pirates of the Spanish Main, we said in a, over a 10-year period perhaps there were 5,000 pirates in the early 1700s, but probably no more than 2,000 operating at any one time. In the South China Sea, there were 50,000 pirates operating at one time. So this is a huge pirate community. Now, why? Now, if they're easing up on the bans on trade, and much of what was described as piracy in the past were armed smugglers uh, who smuggled because they felt they had to because there was this total ban on international trade, and now trade restrictions are easing. Why do we get this explosion? There are a series of explanations for this. One, just as in the Caribbean you go where the money is, so too in South China there was a grand opportunity because there was a vast international trade going on of valuable goods that could readily be accessed. Looking at this map of South China, here we've boiled it down. Okay, yeah, hold on, let me, yeah, that's good. Here you can see Canton, we're up much closer, all right? Here's Canton here. And this is the Pearl River, and it's the Pearl River estuaries that lead down into the South China Sea. Canton is becoming one of the major ports of China. It is in particular, and will be as of 1757, the exclusive port for foreigners to trade in China. Remember, not all restrictions have been gotten rid of. And as of 1757, all foreigners who wanted to trade with China had to come through here. It's a little bit like what we were talking about with Spain, where Spain only allows you know, goods coming out of uh, the Western Hemisphere to come from Veracruz, okay? and from Panama, very similar kind of situation here, only in this case, trade coming into China has to go through this one port. So here you have all of this valuable international trade being funneled up through this one area. So naturally, these waters in this area are going to be rich uh, with potential targets for pirates because people, you know, all of this trade is coming up through this area. So one factor is the simple reality that international trade with China is being funneled only through Canton as of 1757. Okay, So as Canton becomes this international emporium for China and becomes the exclusive gateway for foreigners, basically Europeans, to trade with China, suddenly you have a set of rich targets that are being funneled into one area, just as targets were being funneled into the Caribbean. Okay. And so too, just as they had to go to Veracruz and Portobello, here now, foreigners who are coming into trade with China have to go only to Canton. So it provides a rich source of targets. There is also a rich source of people to serve as pirates in this area. This part of China has been one of the areas that has endured a particularly explosive growth in population. Remember, this is the time when China's population is doubling. Well, it's more than doubling in the area of South China. Uh, let's go back to the map for just a second. This whole area west of Canton here is rich in river estuaries, fertile soil, and people had poured in over the centuries to exploit this land. And by this time, by the 18th century, 
they have reached the limits of their technology in terms of exploiting the land and producing crops. People are being forced off the land by more powerful families. So tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are finding themselves without land and without a source of income. What is going to happen to them? How are they going to survive? Because of this massive explosion of population, because the more powerful families, the more powerful peasants have forced the less well-off off the land itself, where are they going to go? They're going to go to the sea as their last resort, as their last opportunity to survive. These people would be described today as the boat people. Uh, they were known at the time as the tanka, or egg families. Uh, it was a disparaging term, it was an insulting term that they, you know, uh, repopulated themselves like eggs hatching all the time, that there were thousands and thousands of these people. If you go along the riverways and along the coast, uh, you could stand on the shore and look out and what you would see is not a sea of water, but a sea of small sampans tied to each other, uh, fishing vessels on which these people live, which people spent their entire lives. People were often born, married, died on the boats. Uh, they had no life on the land anymore. This was their one opportunity, was to engage in fishing activity. And they were desperately poor. And these were people who had very little in the way of economic resources. Bare subsistence was most that, that they could hope for in most cases. Furthermore, they were outcasts from society. An important aspect of Chinese culture is identification with location that you grow up, live, die in the same village, in the same region. Century after century, your family is identified with a region. And also identified with that village or that area or that town are your ancestors. Ancestor worship is a vitally important part of Chinese culture as well. Ancestors of your clan. Being part of a clan is a central part of Chinese identity, an extended family that you belong to. And an important function, a vital function of the clan is ancestor worship, paying homage to your ancestors, which in turn is tied to a specific location. These people no longer have that kind of identity. They have been swept from the land. And for most of them, their memory of ancestors dates back no more than one or two generations. They don't fit in with the rest of society in that fashion. One of the things that is essential in terms of establishing your social status and your identity in society is your clan and your ancestors. These people don't have those linkages that give them that kind of tie. And clan is important in getting ahead in society. Clan mem you know, clans are vertical. You've got wealthy members of the clan, middling members, poor members, and those at the bottom look to the better off within their own clan to help them get ahead in life, to help them deal with the imperial bureaucracy, etc. These people don't have access to those things. They don't have those ties. They've been broken as they have been swept off the land and onto the boats to become these boat people of the 18th century. So here is a population without roots, that is desperately poor, and they provide an ideal source of pirates. Now, here are people who, for the most part, have very little to lose if they take on a piratical activity, if they take on a criminal activity. Now, much of this at this time, in the early stages, is petty piracy. You know, what will happen typically is a fisherman will decide, you know, I've had enough of this. I'm barely making it. I'm barely feeding my family. So he'll recruit a couple of his neighbors. They'll get into the boat one day, sail down, and maybe there's a small merchant vessel, a river vessel, not much bigger than a rowboat itself. Uh, they'll come alongside with a couple of crude weapons, a couple of knives, jump on board, you know, stab or intimidate uh, the crewmen, steal some bundles of cloth or whatever might be on there, and sail off. You know, and that's typical of what piracy was in its early stages here in the South China Sea. Uh, as these people start to turn to piracy as a way of survival, as a way of accumulating some basic wealth. So it's pretty basic at this time, small sampans, small fishing boats, and most of these activities are one-shot deals. You know, you get together, a couple of people get together, they carry out, you know, an attack on a merchant boat of some kind, steal some goods, and then that's it. And they hope to get away, they hope not to get caught and be executed. Uh, but 
in most cases, these are not continuing criminal enterprises that are going on week after week, month after month. Now, one place where piracy and smuggling are flourishing in particular is Chen Ping in Vietnam. Chen Ping, let's go back to the map, is not far from these areas where piracy has started to develop. Okay? You won't be able to see the actual name. It's in the dark portion of the water here. But this is Chen Ping here. Okay? It's just inside Vietnam, although there's some dispute about that at the time. But it's just inside Vietnam, and here's China over here. Okay? And this is going to become a major source of smugglers and pirates at this time. And it's right in the same region. Okay? where smuggling is in piracy is becoming a very important activity in the 18th century. Now, the reason why Jinping is so important at this time is because it is a major port for trade between China and Vietnam. And smuggling and piratical activity are important because the major goods that are available for trade are prohibited. Vietnam prohibits the export of rice. Why? Because the Vietnamese government, as other governments at this time, are afraid that if rice is being exported, that there'll be food shortages or that the price of rice will go up rapidly. And nobody wants to face a starving population. No ruler wants to face food riots. So the Vietnamese, as other imperial systems would do at this time, banned the export of rice to try to make sure that they had sufficient domestic rice and that would help ensure domestic stability. Meanwhile, the Chinese forbid the export of iron. They believe that the iron they're producing is needed for their own domestic development. So here you have a situation where the Chinese won't export iron, the Vietnamese won't export rice, and yet people on each side of the border have a real demand for precisely those products. So smuggling becomes an explosive activity in this area. At the same time, with smuggling happening, piracy also becomes a significant activity because it's relatively easy to prey upon smugglers. I mean, who are smugglers going to complain to? You know, I'm busy smuggling rice across you know, the estuary that separates Jiangping from China, and I get attacked by pirates. Well, what am I going to do? Go run to the Chinese authorities or the Vietnamese authorities and say, oh, well, they stole my boat. Oh, they stole your boat that you're smuggling all that illegal rice in. I see. So when you have widespread smuggling, it's an ideal opportunity for pirates to operate because they know that the person who is the victim of the pirate attack really doesn't have a legal authority that he can turn to to try to get retribution. As a result, piracy virtually becomes the mainstay of this Vietnamese city's economic activities in these years. Still, piracy is at a relatively simple level. Uh, they're a little better armed than they were before. Uh, some of these people operate on a regular basis now as pirates. But still, it's mostly small boats uh, attacking other small boats that are engaged in the trade along the riverways here and are engaged in this illegal trade. But it gives a new stimulus to piracy, again, because the victims of piracy in this case really don't have a recourse in terms of complaining and asking for the local government to suppress the pirates. But the critical moment for the growth of piracy in South China, in the South China Sea, comes in Vietnam in the 18th century with political upheaval, with what's called the Taeson Rebellion. In Vietnam in the 18th century, a rebellion breaks out against the existing imperial dynasty. It's called the Taeson Rebellion because that's the name of the village where the leaders of the rebellion were born. Uh, they were the Win brothers, you don't have to remember that. Um, but they were born in the village of Taeson, and so it took on the name of the Taeson Rebellion. So you have the imperial system being challenged by these rebels who will eventually, at least for a time, succeed in overthrowing the government. The Taeson Rebellion against the Lure emperors is successful. However, China treats Vietnam, and Vietnam had been essentially a subordinate state, a tribute state over the centuries. So the Chinese emperor is interested in trying to uh, maintain the Lure emperors in power, since they are recognized for us, and they have been, from the Chinese perspective, 
reasonably reliable, so they do not want to see the Taizan rebels successful. Despite China's invasion in 1785, however, the Taizan rebels are successful in getting rid of the Lur dynasty, at least in the short term. But their victory is by no means complete. And in fact, over the next 15 years or so, they're going to spend much of their time fighting to hold on to what they have won. And in the process, they are going to need a navy. They are going to need naval forces that can help them, supply them with weapons, help maintain trade in these wartime conditions, and serve as a military naval force to attack their enemies. Where to find a navy? Hmm? Chinese pirates are readily available. They're just a few miles away on the northern border of Vietnam. There are thousands of them. So now, in the latter years of the 18th century, after 1785, thousands of Chinese pirates are going to move into Vietnam and help form a navy for the Taizong rebels. They will serve, essentially, as privateers. I mean, that's what we would understand them to be. That's what Western governments would describe them as, because they're given commissions by the Taizong government to act as a naval force, although they're also engaged heavily in piratical activity at the same time. I mean, one of the things the Taizongs need is money. One way to get money is to have these pirates, who are now working under commission to the Taizong government, have these pirates go out and attack ships, seize goods, and share those goods with the Vietnamese government. So now the pirates have what we see in almost every successful case of pirates, they have a political patron. They have a state that's willing to protect them and give them a chance to become more organized and more efficient. That's what's happened here in the South China Sea, and that is helping to lead to this explosive growth in pirate activity. One of the most noted of the Chinese pirates was Chen Tian Pao. He was given the title of General Pao Virtuous Marquis. Uh, this was an official title from the Taizong Emperor, making him a government official of Vietnam. So here he's gone from simply being a Chinese pirate captain to being a government official in Vietnam. Now this, again, gives him status, and it gives him, of course, a certain degree of protection because if the Chinese Navy comes after him, he can, of course, flee to a Vietnamese port and seek protection there. Again, the same kind of thing that we've seen uh, with the Barbarossas and with others, this kind of relationship with a state system has major advantages for the pirates because it gives them protection against the attempts of suppression by other organized states, in this case, the Chinese Empire. The Chinese pirates really grow and mature, shall we say, as a group during these years in Vietnam. They become highly organized. Up until this time, as we've seen, they were very much like the freebooters, in fact, operated on a smaller scale generally in terms of the size of their vessels and the number of people operating in any single pirate gang. But now, operating in Vietnam, they're becoming more organized. They have larger ships. They acquire better armaments, and they become more organized. There's more consistency. I mean, some of them actually have uh, official naval titles. They operate as the official Vietnamese Navy, if you will. Now, of course, on the one hand, they're also engaged in looting and piratical activities, but they're also becoming more organized in terms of having official titles, in terms of having a command structure, in terms of the size of their operations. All of this is taking place. And they have with it, of course, seals and certificates that give them these titles and also commission them to carry out whatever pirate activities they may be engaged in. So they have become a very substantial military force in the course of the latter years of the 18th century as they take on this role with the Taizong government in Vietnam. Now, the Chinese government will attempt to suppress the pirates who have become an even greater threat than ever before because there are more of them, their ships are bigger, they're better organized. Um, but these efforts are at best ineffective. They are unable to suppress these pirates. If in the past uh, they could 
run sweeps and at least temporarily suppress uh, the smugglers of the past and at least some of the pirate activity. By now, the pirates have grown so powerful and China's own system so weak, as we will see in greater detail in the second half, uh, that the naval suppression of the Chinese pirates at this time uh, is simply an impossible task for the Chinese. And so they try the other alternative that they've used before, which is grant an amnesty. You know, if you can't beat them, then have them join you. So they offer amnesties to the pirates. Uh, this is not very successful because from the pirates' point of view, you know, why should we accept an amnesty in most cases? It's almost impossible for the Navy to defeat us at sea if we do run into trouble and we're outnumbered. We'll just flee into one of the Vietnamese ports and the Chinese Navy will be reluctant to try to come into that port and face na uh, shore guns that would be aimed at them. This would get very dicey for them. It would be very difficult for them to function effectively uh, in one of the ports of Vietnam trying to attack the pirates. So very few of the pirates are going to accept these amnesties because they really have nothing to lose, at least not at that moment, at least not at the end of the 18th century. However, all good things must pass, and so too the situation in Vietnam for the pirates that was so beneficial is going to change by the beginning of the 19th century. Specifically, in 1802, uh, the Taesan were defeated, they were overthrown, the Lur emperors are going to be restored, and that means, of course, that the Chinese pirates, who are the close allies, the officials of uh, the Taesan government, are now out of luck. You know, they don't have that kind of secure base that they once had. Now, they had benefited, as I said, tremendously from this experience. Over a period of about 15 years, they had become a highly organized criminal force in the sense that they had organized themselves into fleets uh, recognized by different flags. There was the red flag fleet and the black flag fleet uh, with a senior commander and then a chain of command that went down through a series of vessels. This was a level of organization far beyond anything we've seen uh, in the case of the pirates of the Spanish Main. And this looks more like an informal navy than a group of pirates. Uh, their ability to organize has been greatly enhanced by this experience. The technology that they have at their command is considerably enhanced. They are no longer dealing simply out of sampans. Now they are sailing junks, and I'll show you pictures of some of the uh, pirate ships later on in the second half. But now they're sailing substantial seagoing vessels uh, armed with cannon and other equipment. They are a powerful force and they are highly organized. They have also established uh, a system of what's called patron-client relationships. In other words, uh, these are not just informal alliances, yeah, let's get together and go attack somebody. Uh, within these fleets, there are a series of relationships. In other words, someone is brought in, let's say a promising captain is brought into the fleet and given a ship, and he now owes his position to the commander of that particular fleet. So too, his second in command is someone appointed by the commander of the fleet. These people down the chain owe their positions to the commander. They tend to share, in fact, they have to share the goods that they secure with the commander. And so, too, goods that are captured by other members, other captains in the fleet, are shared with the other captains within the fleet itself. So there is a set of relationships which tie people into one of the fleets, where they are sharing in the goods that are captured by other captains, and they owe their position, their appointment, to the head of the fleet. So this isn't just a loose set of alliances, two or three, you know, it's not like Steed, Bonnet, you know, and Blackbeard getting together and saying, okay, well, we'll work together for a while. This is a much more formalized organization with these patron-client relationships in place with the head of the fleet as the patron who provides positions for the captains, who provides appointments on those ships to other promising individuals that may be captured during pirate activity and who shares the goods that are captured by the different vessels in the fleet. This is a highly complex organization now and is far more developed than anything we've seen in the Spanish Main and certainly far more developed than anything that had existed in the South China Sea before the sort of Taesan epoch, uh, this period of experience in Vietnam. 
They have also gained considerable combat experience. I mean, they, they aren't just pirates, you know, most of the pirates in the Spanish Main mostly operated as pirates most of the time. You fell upon a single merchant vessel or two or three and robbed them. These pe people during this period have been engaged in major naval battles. They didn't just rob, they didn't just carry out pirate activities. They were also involved in invading parts of Vietnam, assisting the Taysan forces, defending them against the, the Chinese Navy, etc. These are experienced naval commanders. And they are not just pirates. So they've gained that experience as well. Now their problem is, what's a pirate to do when he can't go home? <laughs> you know, this has been home for 15 years for many of them, but now the Taysan dynasty has been very short-lived. They're gone. Uh, the old dynasty has been restored, and they have to figure out what to do. Where's a pirate to go? That is what we will figure out in the second half, and we will see what the response of these pirates is and how, indeed, instead of a defeat, this expulsion from Vietnam turns into an even greater expansion of their activities, a more formalized organization, a more powerful piratical fleet than had ever been seen on the face of the earth before. All of this will come out of their exile from Vietnam. We'll pick up on that in the second half.